If you'd like to turn to Matthew 10 in your Bible or on your device, this is Matthew's recording of the instructions that Jesus gave to the twelve when he sent them out. And he says this in verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you've received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor copper in your money belts, nor bag for your journey, nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor stuffs, for a worker is worthy of his food. Know whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and stay there till you go out. When you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whoever will not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Surely I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men. For they will deliver you up to their councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Brother will deliver up brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly, I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher, and a servant like his master. They've called the master of the house Beelzebub. How much more will they call those of the household? Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. I could read on, but all I want you to get from that at this moment is what an assignment. This is not a sort of, this is going to be great guys, just go and have fun. This is saying, look, I'm sending you out and it could be tough. And you think, well, why then did Jesus have so much confidence to send them out? Well, it's obvious that he felt that they were sufficient for the task. He was sending them out as sheep among wolves, but he wasn't expecting them to get consumed. He was saying, you can go and you can do this. He's talking about some of the things that they would face. I want you to notice the context He was sending them to Israel. I actually think the message would have been different if he was sending them to the Gentiles. And we're going to have to face the fact that we need to understand culture, and we're looking at this in the final session, when we're looking at multiplication. You can't just do Nigerian church in every nation of the world and expect the whole world to get saved. Or British church for that matter, which was what the previous generation had to endure. And it was when the missionaries left that the churches began to grow in most places. And it's this inability to realise that the gospel is endlessly capable of being culturally relevant. And yet we think that what works for us is the only way it's going to work for everyone else. And so we miss things like, this is how they were told to go to the people of Israel. Now you've just got to remember the context here, that God had been sending prophets to Israel again and again and again and again. And they'd suffered all kinds of rejection and everything else. But God is saying, and yet again I will send. And basically, he's sending them before his face. 
because he said he himself will come to these places. And they were like the messengers. Go and proclaim there's one who is coming, who's greater. Heal the sick, raise the dead. But they're just signifiers that there's a saviour who's coming. And this is just the preparatory acts. If a great king was coming, he'd send an entourage in advance. Please don't think that the way a king arrives is that he comes first and everyone comes behind him. Do you know? They actually send in people first to prepare the way. You know, I've, I've known preachers that have come from the States who've sent me a list. Can you make sure all of these things are in place before I come? <laughs> so you have to check the hotel, you have to do this, you do that. And one particular evangelist, he wanted sniffer dogs to search the building. And uh, so when I rang the Met, they said, we don't even do that for royalty. Just tell him he's fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> <clears throat> but people come before. And so Jesus said to them, look, I want you to go into these places with absolutely nothing. Not a penny on you. Because we want to find out how many people in this nation that God has been working with for generation after generation after generation after generation are really serious about the things of God. Because if there's anyone worthy, they will open their house to you. And they say, you're welcome. And you can stay there. And they will feed you and look after you at their expense. You won't need to take a staff. You won't need to take all of these things. You'll find a reception. And then he says, and if you don't find that reception, you can shake the dust from off your feet. Because in other words, this is a sign against them that they had an opportunity and yet they didn't receive. Now, it's very easy to take that and put it into a context in which people have never heard the gospel, never had the opportunity to respond and think that they deserve to be treated in exactly the same way. I'm trying to say there's a context to this. And so he sends them out as sheep amongst wolves. What a thing to say when Israel considered itself to be the flock of God. <laughs> and he says, I'm sending you. And, and you won't have gone round all of the cities in Israel before we say, that's it, the time has come. Now, I don't think that was talking about the second coming. I think that was the moment when Jesus was nailed up on the cross and, and that was the moment when everything was settled. And they probably hadn't managed to get round every, every city in Israel before that moment. I know we can put a second coming context into it, but I, I actually think that there's a, a different context that's coming across here. But sending them out as, as, as sheep amongst the wolves, he has so much confidence in his church. And this is a, like an embryonic church. This is just the first 12. But don't run away with that idea that they had at the time of the Protestant Reformation when they, they failed to claim the Great Commission because they actually believed the Great Commission was reserved to the first apostles. And so I mean, ridiculously at a time when the church was finding fresh truth and it should have found fresh energy to go into all the world, it just sort of sat with its arms folded basically saying, well if God sends us we will go. And sort of somehow ignored the Great Commission. But that great commission should be sounding in our ears. We are sent out. Someone says you can't spell God without spelling go. Well, that's true in our language. In different languages, it doesn't work the same way. <laughs> but, but at least we should understand <laughs> that there's a sense in which God wants us to go. But before he says go, he says come. And so the radical community that is capable of going has first and foremost to be a community that's capable of coming. You can't send what you don't have. Yes. Do you know, I know I say this a lot, but I meet people that, that are, are trying to work out where they are in the fivefold ministry. Am I an apostle? Am I a prophet? Am I an evangelist? Am I a pastor? Am I a teacher? Well, all of those ministries are sent ministries, aren't they? That he sends these ministries. Well, you can't be sent if you're not owned. I mean, I can't send something that belongs to someone else, can I? You know, I can't, I, I know I use this illustration, but I, I can't say to Edward, look, Edward, I want to give you a watch, so 
here you are, here's a watch. You say, you can't give him that because it's not yours. And here we are, we're saying, God, I, I want to be sent as an apostle, I want to be sent as this. And he's saying, well, do you mind giving yourself to me first? Because I can only give what I've got. And it's that ability to surrender to him as we were singing. You know, we surrender. Do we really mean it? We surrender to him. And then, then when he's got us, he can send us. So the first call to the disciples was come. And then he was able to say, go. So the radical community is a community that's prepared to send, surrender everything in the coming, but also to surrender everything in the going. <laughs> Because you then know that he's all sufficient. But I believe too that a radical community is also sensitive to the surroundings in which it is sent. We're not asking for people to be stupid here, you know? I'm not suggesting that you get on a plane without having paid the fare and then arrive in a place that no one's invited you to and expect them to pay the hotel bill. I've been in parts of Africa where pastors have said to me, we've got this real problem. We've got this person staying in the most expensive hotel in town. And they said that God sent them and God will pay the bill. And now we're faced with paying the bill. What do we do? Well, it's very tempting to say. <laughs> <coughs> Maybe it's the time to talk to the police. But... <laughs> Save yourself the money. But, <laughs> but we're not asking you to be foolish. You're, you're to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. There is a specific context to this. But as you appreciate the context, you can see the significance of it. There are times when I know that God has sent me to preach in a place where I think, why do they want me to preach there? Everyone's preached there. But sometimes you think God's just saying, I want them to hear it again. And, and you just have to be obedient. And it's his choice, isn't it? So being a radical community doesn't mean always acting in a way that's completely off the wall and bizarre. It means that we understand the context, that we've come with commitment to Christ and we've let him send us where we ought to go. <clears throat> and if need be, we consult on that. You know, people have often said to me, how do I discern the will of God? Okay, well, one useful way I was told is this. You have a hand, look at it, all right? You have a finger that points, okay? So that points upwards, that really is saying, God, I'm asking you first, all right? And then you've got this finger here, all right? And... I think that really, again, we're talking about pointing. We, we can look at other people as well and, and, and draw them in. In fact, sometimes I say it's that one, the relationship one. But really we're looking at certain things coming together. The Word of God, the prayerful seeking God, the relationship, that's where the ring is, reminds you that it's relationship. You don't just do it without talking to other people. And then perhaps... One that we often forget is the circumstances. You, you, you need to know absolutely from God if he's saying to you, go against the circumstances. Because very often, what God does is he orchestrates the circumstances, so he sets before you an open door. And, and open doors are often an indication that you're walking in the will of God. Because sometimes this idea of, well, I'll kick the door down come what may, is, is not necessarily as wise or sensible as your uh, dramatic intentions might seem. And when, when the doors were closed for Paul, it sent him back to seek God afresh and to say, Lord, where do you want me to go? He didn't kick the doors down. I know I've been tempted to at times. I know when, when the door first closed for us, when we were missionary candidates, we were meant to be going out to Zambia and the door suddenly closed, I wanted to kick that door down, you know? I said, God, you told me we were going. Hmm? And eventually, I remember sitting there in the car one day, Marion and I were still engaged at this point, we were accepted as missionaries, we were going to get married and go out. And we were sitting in the car one day, and I actually remember saying to Marion, this was when I was dropping her off outside her parents' house, I said, you know, I feel as if I'm being torn apart. On one hand, I'm holding on to God, and on the other hand, I'm holding on to my vision. 
And I said, I need to ask God. And as soon as I asked God, do you know what he said? He said, hold me with both hands. And all the vision that you need is in me. <coughs> it was quite a difficult moment, I must admit, because it's like, oh, I want to hold on to that. I really do. You know? But in letting go of that and holding him with both hands, it brought me into peace. And when you're looking at your hand and you, you, you can see that there's, there's the word, there's prayer, there's relationship, there's circumstances, each one of these can be touched by the peace of God. If you see it like that. And if you don't have peace in those things, if you don't have peace about what people are saying, if you don't have peace about what you believe the Lord is saying, if you don't have peace about what you're reading in the Word, and you don't have peace about the circumstances, then you haven't yet discerned the will of God in the situation. Because it's coming to peace about what God is showing you that is so important. I hope that's just helpful to someone. But it's part of what being a radical community is. Radical does not mean stupid. It does not mean, you know, going and taking chances. See the context in which they were told not to take these things. It was to test people who should have been hospitable because they were the people of God. This was the flock of God they were going to. They were going to the lost sheep of Israel. And yet he says, I'm sending you out amongst wolves. It's a big challenge, isn't it, to see this? But this is part of what I wanted to get across when I'm talking about radical community. Because I think that there is a disposition which the church needs to discover that could actually open more doors than we believe was possible. As I've already said, I don't believe we should be in the business of trying to kick down the doors. But I do believe that we should have a disposition that actually contributes to the opening of doors. And some of that has to do with becoming the kind of people that God wants to open doors for. Because he knows the situation that you're planning to go into. And one of the reasons he might shut the door is because you're not ready to go there yet. You might go there and be more of a pain than a blessing. So he's saying, hold on, hold on, I'm, I, I want to change you. And some of us, we think that we're going to go around the world like the Lion of Judah, but actually he wants us to go around the world like the Lamb that's been slain, with a greater degree of humility. And one of the things I was very fortunate at was that we were looking at going to Africa as missionaries in the early 70s, around the time that nations were getting their independence. And we had it hammered into us that if you go, you go to serve. You are the former colonial power. The last thing they will need is you to go in any autocratic spirit. You can't go to teach. You go to assist. And then I realised that the, the Macedonian call that everyone goes on about was extraordinary because... Paul was told, come and help us. Well, who was he going to help? Because as far as I know, this was virgin territory for the gospel. <laughs> who was he going to help? I mean, surely, of all pioneering situations, that was one where you go in and say, I'm, in, I'm the man. But he had to help. That meant he had to submit to people who had not yet come to know the Lord and to come alongside them, to work with them. And that's exactly what he did, isn't it? with Lydia's people who met and prayed by the river. And he didn't march in in day one and say, let me show you a more excellent way. He prayed with them. Come to help. And this is all part of that same spirit about ruling in the midst. God opens doors for sheep. <laughs> God opens doors for people that come with that kind of disposition. Do you know, I'd like us to see the church as an army of sheep. Now, I know that's a little bit difficult because when you let sheep out, they tend to sort of want to head in all directions. But eventually they sort of get themselves together and amble off together. I don't know if you've noticed that. They do tend to conglomerate. Mark has a wonderful story about some of the animals that he kept in Barbados. Uh, actually, because uh, in Barbados you don't realise just how close the rural is to the town. So he had, I think it was sheep or goats that all got out. It was sheep that got out and he had got a telephone call at work. Can you get them out of the supermarket? <laughs> so... <laughs> So all his sheep had all gone off together and ended up in the supermarket. 
don't know what they bought, but they'll buy. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's something, isn't there, about, about the way the Lord looks at his church. We might be terrible as an army with banners in a spiritual sense, but at the same as the one that you look upon in Revelation 5, where you're looking for the lion of the tribe of Judah and you think, wow, this is going to be an incredible roar. And all you get is a silent lamb. Because there's this interesting juxtaposition. What you look like in the spirit might be very different from what you look like in the flesh. <laughs> and in some of these situations, we need to be going in in a spirit of humility. Doors are open for those who help. <laughs> Think more and more they shut for those who are intending to take over. Mind you, that doesn't stop some people going. They kick the door in anyway. <laughs> but how much fruit there is when they've done that. See, I want to talk about the passion of the church for a few moments. And, and I think passion in the church is really important. Whether you see yourself as an army of sheep, which I hope you do, and you're happy to have that kind of disposition... <coughs> You're, you're going into that situation in a way that is lamb-like and yet at the same time Jesus said I've come to send fire upon the earth and would that it was already kindled he was speaking obviously before his death and resurrection whereon it was kindled I mean when those apostles went out they went out as fire upon the earth and, and you can tell whether someone's really sent by how much fire they have. Hmm? I mean, I'm talking about the fire of the Spirit. I don't mean, some people can preach fiery and there's no fiery there. You know, it's sort of, you can shout loud and kick high and scream at everyone and they say, oh, he was a fiery preacher. But it doesn't mean to say there was any warmth there. No? It just have been a fireworks display for all that it was. Lots of bangs and crashes and nothing much happens. But you can have the fire of the Spirit and you know it's put a burning passion in your heart. Sometimes it, it's really painful. But you know that you've got that passion in your heart. And it's that passion on the inside that means that you've been sent of God. And it's the sending that makes all the difference. If you look at Isaiah, the Lord says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? He doesn't say, I'll go. He says, Lord, here am I. Send me. And it's back with that same principle that authority comes in the sending, not just in the going. That's why you have to come before you can go. Because when you come and you go, then you're sent. <laughs> and that makes a difference because he only sends fire. I know that sounds quite radical, but if there's no fire in someone, you have to ask the question, were they sent or did they just come? Because that which is sent from God has some fire. Now, you can fan the fire into more flame. I think Timothy, at times, was more Timothy than Timothy. <laughs> and he was told to fan into flame the gift that was in him, or, or stir up the gift that was in him. And sometimes the fan needs to be put on the flame. But these days, more and more, I look for a spark. Do you know? Sometimes I have to see the spark by faith because some people don't look very sparky. <laughs> but there are some people that look very fiery and there's no spark. And there are some people that look half asleep and you think if you can give me an hour with that person, somehow I'll find something that we can fan into flame. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that which can be fanned into flame. You, you might not think that you're a radical world changer. But let God begin to blow on that flame in your heart. And, and you could be a transforming presence in places. Now, I think the church should be a company of passionate people. I don't think it should be, primarily, a company where people become passionate. Do you see there's a difference? I think that what God's seeking to do in these days is to ignite people by the power of the Spirit and bring them together as living coals from the altar. Rather than bringing a bunch of cold coals together in the hopes that someone 
will actually come with the spark that will ignite it all. I think we put too much expectation on preachers to set us alight. Hmm? And, and you know sometimes the preacher's really up against it. You haven't spent any time with the Lord in ages, and you come and you sit there with it, well, let's see what this one can do for us mentality. <laughs> you know? And afterwards you say, well, he wasn't much good, he didn't set me on fire. <laughs> it's not meant to be the preacher who sets you on fire. Yeah. You're meant to be on fire. Yes, sir. And when you come to church, it should create an amazing blaze because all of the fire has come together. Now, I don't have a problem with you getting warmed up by other people. That's fine. But I do think that there should be a, a passion that comes from your personal relationship with God, not just by rubbing shoulders with the person who sits next to you in church. Okay? Because if, you're, if your spiritual temperature goes up and down according to who you sit next to, you've got problems. Because you could end up with a cold coal on either side of you one Sunday <laughs> and nothing will spark. <laughs> But if you've got something that's lit up by God and you come into that place, then God will blow on the flame. And that's what we need to see. I'm, I'm really committed to this sense of we need to be passionate people coming together. And the fellowship that you get when passionate people come together is incredible. Because, you know, it's like iron sharpens iron. Well, spark ignites spark. It sort of gets you going, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and the, the, the flame that comes from a lot of positive, ignited people coming together is far, far greater than if you took each individual one and added it up. There's a multiplication in the conflagration. Do you understand? You know, they say, it, with team, together each achieves more. Well, it's like that when passionate people come together that there's something about the fire. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of passion that makes everyone who's come for the first time feel excluded. You know? We are so wild, we're so off the wall that everyone else thinks, oh my goodness, let's give that bunch a miss. Because there's a difference between the exuberance of the flesh <laughs> and the passion of the spirit. And to be honest, when, when people come to church, they don't need to meet more flesh in church than they could meet in the world. You know, I mean, in some places, they, they'd find more fleshly friendship if they went to a club than if they came into certain churches. They're looking for something different. They're not looking for what the world offers. They're looking for something. Jesus said, by this they'll know you're my disciples, in that you have love one for another. Now, that doesn't mean that you're constantly engulfing one another in bear hugs at the door so that the new people can't get in because there's this great loving in the door that's going on. That's not what, what's looked at. It's, it's actually the amount that you care for one another. There's a sense in which people can pick that up. It's, it's not just that kind of fleshly loving. And, and when Paul talks to the Thessalonians, he says, concerning love of the brethren, you don't need anyone to teach you because you yourselves have been taught of God. And there are churches that say, oh, we don't need anyone to teach us how to love. We've been taught of God. And yet they, they love everyone in exactly the same way. You know, you might be the shyest person on the planet, but you will be engulfed in a bear hug for five minutes as you come into the door. And you think, I'm never going to go there again. <laughs> And they say, but we know how to love everybody. And you think, well, they don't know how to love me. <laughs> because love is sensitive to where the other person's at. It's not forcing my style of loving upon you. It's actually reaching out to you where you're at. You know, I made a big mistake for years in our marriage. I would treat my wife the way I wanted to be treated. So when I came home, I didn't want to talk about work. I didn't want to talk about what my day was like. So I gave her exactly the same treatment. I didn't want to hear what she'd had or anything like that. <laughs> I thought, you know, I, I like silence, so I'll give you silence. And she wanted conversation. And it was great when I realised that she wanted conversation and she realised that I wanted silence and we sort of had a pleasant compromise. <laughs> but we, we'd been missing each other on this for a long time because we were giving what we were comfortable with rather than thinking about What's the other person comfortable with? And so passion in church isn't just demonstrating your exuberance. 
It's having the sensitivity to know how to meet that person's need. And to be honest, there are times you'll need to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. You don't need to do it the wrong way round, you know? Never mind, I, you know, he was no use anyway. You're better off without him. That is not necessarily the best way to deal with someone who's just had a partner walk out on them. You know, they might actually be feeling the pain of it. And you might think, well, that's how I deal with it. Well, that might not be how they're dealing with it. There's a time you have to weep with those who weep. Whatever your theological position. You know, some of you might say, but I believe we should rejoice evermore. Yeah, you do rejoice evermore. But if someone's crying, you don't go, hallelujah, I'm so excited you've got all those problems. You weep with them. And that's part of the passion of church. It's not uncontrolled passion. It's the real passion that, that we should be demonstrating of a, a radical, loving people. And I think passion has to come before compassion. Those kind of acts of compassion where we can do this and we can do that and we can do the other in the community. That makes us look like nice people. But it doesn't make us look like exceptional people. <laughs> It's only that demonstration of the love of God one to another that can make us look exceptional. Jesus didn't say, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples in that you run food banks. No? Although that's important, we should be. I'm not decrying that, but I'm saying that the compassion should come out of the passion. It should come out of the fact that we're a company of people who love each other so much and we want to love the world so much. And we love God so much that we want to demonstrate his love to the world. So if you've got that passion that comes from the Lord, then the compassion takes on a different level. And you don't have to sort of put a label on it, I want you to know that this particular gift that has arrived for you has arrived from the saints at such and such a church, you know? It's, it's not about advertising who you are. It's not necessarily even about pushing the gospel on, onto people. It's, it, it's demonstrating the gospel. And this compassion is really, really important. Um, so when we come to church with a passion, we've come to gain wisdom. I think you should see church as a place where you gain wisdom rather than a church that you gain passion. And I'd actually like more preaching to be about giving people wisdom than giving people passion. I don't necessarily want to send out people excited. They should have come in excited. I want to be able to send them up a little bit more wise in the things of God. Giving them some advice how to use that passion. It's the same principle. If something's moving, you can steer it. But you get a whole bunch of people that are going nowhere and what you're trying to do is to liven them up. It's not going to work. You know, it's like you can't breathe life into a dead horse somewhere along the line. God's got to do something in that situation. It's got to be resurrection life. You can't just catch it for a moment in a service and expect it to last you through till Saturday afternoon before the next dose. There's got to be more there than that. And then, as God brings that passion. And the other thing I wanted to say along this, and I realise I'm just moving quite quickly through some of these things, is that we've given people in church the option of, are you pioneers or are you settlers? You know the passage in, um, you go back into Numbers 32, which is the point where they're getting close to the promised land, and half the half tribe of Manasseh and two other tribes say, we want to stay this side of the Jordan. We want to stay here because this is a good place for our farmland. It's a great place where we can build stockades and we can make our families safe here. We can settle in this place. And then that leaves the other tribes to go and take the land. And Moses had to deal with contention because the ones that were going in to possess were saying, this isn't fair, you know. To the point where the would-be settlers said, we will take up arms and we will go in front of you. 
So although we are going to take this territory, we are also going to be in the forefront of the battle. So we will take the land for you, and then we will settle back to where we are. And so often I've heard the question, okay, well, what we need in the kingdom is we need pioneers and we need settlers, and some of you can be pioneers and some of you can be settlers. And you look around church, as soon as the option's given, you can see all these faces going, settler, <laughs> settler, <laughs> settler, you know. You think, well, where are the pioneers? And they're, they're all looking at, you know, the pastor and maybe one other, they can do it, you know. But actually, I don't think we should be giving that option. I think we can preach the advantage of settling because there are huge advantages of settling. In a settled environment, you can raise your children effectively. In a settled environment, you can keep that which you have. I think that all of those things are important. But if all you've got is a settled environment, you're never going to take the territory that God has assigned to you. So you need that spirit which says, I'm going to be both. I can see the advantage of creating a base from which we can operate. But I do want to be taking territory for the Lord. And I don't want to come behind in any good thing. So if need be, I will be on the forefront of the fight. And you can then go in with that determination, knowing that there is that which is left there for you. I mean, one of the problems with prosperity preaching is it turns everyone into settlers if you're not careful. Because everyone's saying, well, I fancy that, that's really good, yeah, that's really good. And, and all that you're being motivated towards is the book table that has got the books on that tells you how to be a settler. <laughs> and there needs to be more motivation than that. We're, we're not here for ourselves. It's like some of the holiness teaching that we had in the past where you'd think the most important thing was polishing your crown. You know, and we just keep coming, and we just keep polishing our crown. I feel I've got the shiniest crown here. Do you, know, well, do you know, sometimes you've got to be prepared to get out there where it's rough, and if your crown gets knocked a bit crooked, well, you'll have to live with it and polish it later. Uh, sometimes I've come across people, and I've been through some things. You know, I've had chronic fatigue, I've had all kinds of things, I've been, all sorts of issues have cropped up, and sometimes people say to me, if you had more faith, brother, you wouldn't have gone through that. And sometimes I felt like saying, look, I had, enough faith. I had enough faith to go and join the fight. The reason that you didn't get bruised was you didn't go anywhere near the battle. <laughs> so we need that passion that says, yes, I can see the place for being settlers. You know? and, and there's an income generation that comes from settlers. Praise God for that that people are prepared to mobilize their resources for the kingdom. <coughs> Normally what they do is they mobilize their income. There's very few people that are prepared to mobilize their capital. This is why at the moment giving to the church is so low. It's because people only give out of their income or the interest on their assets. And at the moment the interest rate is so low that you can apply to charitable trust and they've got no money to give you because they don't want to decrease their assets. But there's a point where you say, my assets are for the kingdom too. I know it's about giving the first bit of your increase, but it's amazing how much people increase before we get the first bit sometimes in the kingdom of God. So I love, I love the concept of being settler. I can see the sense of it, but it needs to partner with pioneering and it needs to partner in your own life and in your own experience. You need to be someone who's as much a pioneer as you are a settler. And I, I hope that gets home, because I think that we've had too much of the, uh, well, you can be a settler and someone else will be a pioneer. We need you. We need everyone to be mobilised. I've come across congregations where they say, do you know, we're all too old to do anything. And I say, well, yeah, but what about the community around you? Well, they're all too old as well. Well, you're probably younger than them, so go and reach them. And it's just that, that sense of mobilisation that we need. So passion and compassion, but what about the magnanimity? Because I think that's really important as well, that the church is a generous church. If you look at how the church demonstrated compassion in the early days, 
when the church began, and again, it's, it's, it's a picture where you've got to realise the specialist circumstances. Not all churches are meant to live as communes. But when you discover what it was like in the early church, when 3,000 people responded on the day of Pentecost, and the majority of those did not even live in Jerusalem, and they'd just come to stay for a week, and then decided they were going to stay indefinitely because they wanted to give themselves to the apostles' teaching, there was a desperate need for finance. There was a desperate need for housing. There was a desperate need for everything. You know, if auntie's just brought her case and her toothbrush and now she's staying for three years, you've got a different issue to face. And so people had to sell lands. They had to sell property. They had to have all things in common just to make the thing work, to get the program off the ground. You need to see the context of that. But although that's the specialist context that we've got in Acts 2 and Acts 4, the spirit of generosity should still be with us. And there's something about that spirit of generosity which a lot of people miss. It says no one called that which they possessed their own. It doesn't say no one possessed anything. The church didn't lose its possessions, it's lost its possessiveness. Can you see there's a big difference? You don't have to lose your possessions, but you probably need to lose your possessiveness. Where you're holding on to things with both hands and you're not going to let it go. The Lord's saying, loosen up, loosen up, loosen up. Because give and it will be given unto you. But only if you still keep giving. You don't give in order to get. You give. You give and you forget about it. And it's when you've forgotten about it that God gives it back. Because some people never give. They just sort of lend it to God on the basis of I'm expecting this back hundredfold by the end of the month. That's not giving. That's just lending or giving on elastic. This is radical community where you love one another so much. You don't all have to come and live in my house. I'm not sure that I'd welcome you. I've done that in the past. In fact, at one stage, people would say to us, do we really have to live with you before we join the church? And we say, no, no, no. We, we, we had so many people living with us that even our own children got confused as to <laughs> who was who and which was which. And you don't all have to come and live in the same house in order to have a relationship with one another that's generous generosity being expressed you don't even need to have a home to demonstrate hospitality you, know, you can invite someone out for coffee yeah. even if you haven't got a house that's suitable to invite people back to there are things that you can do you can make space for other people because other people matter it's not just about you this is radical church and we need to be like that and we can be like that. Most of us are only half a step away from demonstrating something extraordinary. We come close, but there's a cautiousness which just keeps us from reaching that point where the world and actually might notice we're doing something significant. Do you think we could reach that tipping point? See, with the early church, not only had they got all things in common, but there's that amazing statement in Acts chapter 5, and with this I finish. Where it says of the church, verse 12, Through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women. What an extraordinary statement. It says no one dared join and yet the numbers were increasing all of the time. And what you realise is this, that people were sensing that this wasn't a group of people that you could just slot in amongst. It was a group of people that was only going to be accessible if you also had a radical transformation. I think that New Testament church was so generous-spirited. They were saying, come, 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 come. 
Yeah, we want you to be part of this. Come, this is amazing. Solomon's porch is incredible. Some of the stories in the book of Acts were so amazing that even when the healing meetings were not able to touch the people who were unable to reach the meetings, they would say, well, let's take some things that can be taken to the people. But I want you to see, it was compassion that drove the miracles. It wasn't just, oh, let's do some extraordinary miracles. Let's, let's lay hands on some cloths. It came out of a desire to bring Jesus to the people. And that's what we need to see. Where the church has just got this great desire. Come on, how, how widely can we open up? How much can we take people in? But I'll tell you this much, that if you open up widely and you really are a church that loves one another, when people come in, their first question will be, how can I change in order to be part of this? How can I be a branch and not just a bird? <laughs> you know, because to be honest, if we all look like birds, and some churches it does look like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I, do, do you know what I mean? I'm saying the commitment level is so low in some congregations that, okay, the mustard tree might have grown, but when you look at that church, there are six branches and 66 birds. And if there was an incident, all the 66 birds would fly away and you'd just be left with the six branches. And a lot of that is because people can't tell the difference between a branch and a bird when they arrive. Because most of the people they meet are birds anyway. They're just lodging there, thinking that maybe one day they'll fly. Yeah, particularly if a better tree turned up down the road. <laughs> You'll never get radical church like that. Some of the biggest churches in the world are the most vulnerable. I've been in church buildings in the States that were built to seat thousands. And there'll be 20, 50 in the congregation. And I say, where everyone, where's everyone? They say, oh, well, when the pastor, new pastor came down the road, <laughs> he built a new building and everyone went there. There's a certain city in the States where they did a church census and discovered there were more people in church than there were in the city. And they thought, how did that work? And they discovered that most people were on two or three church rolls because they moved around so often. <laughs> they were birds and not branches. Let's just take a moment to pray. <coughs> Father, we do see the need for radical communities. And Lord, we have got this sense that if we get this right, then these radical communities can be <coughs> communities that are replicated. And we can see the kingdom movement really, really reach levels that we probably haven't seen since the first century. So Lord, we are here before you, asking you to speak into our hearts and our lives. We've looked at a radical revitalization and a radical reinterpretation so that we're Christ-centered but we also want to be radical communities. And I pray that some of the things that we've looked at in this session will speak to our hearts and help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.